Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chair, Entrepreneurship, Singularity University, Pascal Finet. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So just for you in the back, we've got amazing seats here in the front. And you want to come to the front. We call this the splash zone. So for those of you who are in the first row, get your napkins on. We want to do now, for the next about two hours, uh, give you an overview of exponential technologies and exponential thinking. This is really a grounding in the way we see the world here at Singularity University. And I'm incredibly excited because we brought some of the most amazing speakers we have at Singularity uh, onto this stage to talk about topics such as uh, artificial intelligence and crypto and robotics and medicine. So uh, it's going to be a really jam-packed um, later afternoon session. And before we get into the uh, deep dives, the deeper dives into these actual technologies, what I want to do with you for the next about 10-ish, 15 minutes, is just give you a little bit of an overview of how we're seeing the world here at Singularity University. So again, like we've got a few more seats up in the front, so by all means, come here. Uh, you've got a better view of, um, of the action. And if I can uh, point one thing out for you, and my clicker does not work at the moment. Clicker? There you go. Clicker. So if I can point one thing out for you, and this is um, probably the most important thing I can leave you with for the whole day, and probably the next three days or two days, it is this. Remember that tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. And when I say that, when I say tomorrow will look dramatically different than today, and I believe you will see this throughout this program, what we are talking about is not tomorrow in like five years or 10 years. We are literally talking about tomorrow as in 24 hours from now. And all our speakers will um, address this and will talk about this as well. The underlying trend of all of this, and if you have ever gone to a Singularity uh, University program, and I swear to God, by the end of these three days, you will be uh, dreaming about this curve. It is the exponential curve. And we see this exponential trends underlying many, many things which happen in the world, uh, including computing. And of course, an exponential trend, when you draw it, looks like this. This is a, what we call the hockey stick curve, like a doubling every time period. Go from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. You draw it. It has this hockey stick uh, design. Uh, for those of you who are entrepreneurs and or venture capitalists, I used to be a venture capitalist. Uh, this is your revenue slide. Uh, every, so every entrepreneur is like chuckling. It's like, yes, of course. And here's an interesting fa uh, fun fact about this whole thing. The challenge with this exponential curve is if you stand somewhere where this gentleman stands, which is typically where we are today in most technologies, and you look to the past, the stuff we know, that curve looks dramatically steep, uh, non-steep, flat, and it looks very linear to you. But when you turn your eyesight to the future, which is what we're going to explore over the next uh, two hours, this curve becomes incredibly steep. Ernest Hemingway once called this uh, in a book called The Sun Also Rises. He is, there's a very famous quote in this. The quote goes, how did you go bankrupt, Bill asks. Two ways. Sam responds, gradually and then suddenly. Now, I don't want to have you go bankrupt, but gradually and then suddenly is the way we're seeing these curves, these, the world around us evolve, the world of technology. It moves very slowly, but then suddenly something happens and it becomes crazy. Now, here's the interesting thing. You don't actually even need to invent the future. You can be lazy about this. William Gibson, a very famous science fiction author, once wrote, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And what he means by that is that you can buy tomorrow's technology, you can buy the future, you just need to pay through the nose. You don't even need to invent it. If you wanted to know what a $200 Oculus Rift Go headset, which you can buy on Amazon today, looked like 10 years ago, you could buy that headset. It was just a million dollars. So all you need to do is you need to lift your head and look into the future and explore the future, and you can see it. Now, Ray Kurzweil, our co-founder and um, uh, whom you will also see on this stage here, uh, in 2001 wrote an essay called The Law of Accelerating Returns. And it's fascinating to me, as like a lot of people have heard of it, but never read the essay. So by all means, if I can give you one uh, tip, go on the internet, read the essay. It's a pretty long and dense uh, piece of paper, but it makes a couple of very, very important observations. 
And kind of the core sense of this is that what he found is that the rate of change in evolutionary systems tends to move on an exponential curve. To make this a little bit more understandable, just look at this. This is, ex this is the exponential curve of population growth on this planet. And what is the interesting underlying piece of information in this law of accelerating returns is that one technology, once we make a breakthrough in a technology, that breakthrough very often enables and leads to other sometimes associated and sometimes disassociated breakthroughs. Here's the simplest example I can give you for this, light. Before we had light, the day had began when the sun rose and it ended when the sun set. And in between, you slept because there was no light. You couldn't do anything. The moment we invented light in the form of uh, uh, candles and oil lights, we could extend our daylight hours. So we invented the technology of light and that allowed us to be more productive. And once we got more productive, we could be more creative. And once we got more creative, we created things like the Gutenberg Press. And then the Gutenberg Press allowed us to disseminate information cheaply so that other people could build on it. And then other technologies came. This is the reason why you hear us and particular Ray making the statement that the last hundred years, the next hundred years of technological change will literally, literally look like the next uh, the last 20,000. Let me make this a little bit more clear to you because it's a weird sentence and it's like it took me a while to wrap my head around this. If we plot the exponential growth on a, uh, on a chart and we look at years and we come up with this really crazy idea. So my friends in the first row, we invent a time machine. And with this time machine, because the best thing we can do with a time machine is we decide to bring a friend from 250 years ago, uh, in this case Jane Austen from England, uh, who lived in the 1700 in England, and we bring her to today. How do you think, if you were to take Jane Austen, again, England, 1700, we bring her into today's world? How would she perceive the world? She would probably go crazy, right? I mean, think about it. Like, she will see you make a photo on a device which is like, first of all, taking a photo, right? Like, starting there. Then seeing you taking a photo on this tiny little device, being able to upload it to this thing called the internet, getting into a car driven by electricity when in her world, cars were driven by hay. Right? So there's so many things which have changed in those 250 years exponentially, truly exponentially, that she will probably go mad. Now, we send her back and she's in England and we give her our time machine. And she has this idea. She says, like, oh, I want to repeat this. So I do the same thing. I bring back someone 250 years ago and I invite my friend, the Mona Lisa, who lived about 1500. And the Mona Lisa now walks through the streets in London and she looks left and right. And what does the Mona Lisa say? She will walk through the streets and say, meh. It doesn't look that different, right? It's like, yes, you have the steam engine, and yes, like geopolitics has changed quite a bit, and you have made some progress in science, but it isn't quite as much. So for our friend Jane Austen to repeat the same thing, the same sense of wonder and probably just like going mad, what she needs to do in 1700 is she needs to go back all the way to the prehistoric person who didn't yet have seen the agricultural revolution. That is the crazy rate of change we're exploring. This is the world we're living in. Ray Kurzweil, in his paper, wrote, um, uh, uh, shows you this graph. This graph is really important to understand. And this is basically the uh, rate of change, uh, the exponential rate of change in computing. So you might be familiar with Moore's law. Gordon Moore here in Silicon Valley 50 years ago said the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every two years. It basically means every two years your computer gets twice as fast. Ray was interested in how stable are these trends over a long period of time. So he looked at a slightly different data set. He said, like, how many calculations can I perform per one second per $1,000? And mapped this on a graph. And what he found is that this rate, this exponential rate of change has been true for the last 110 years. Now, what's remarkable about this graph is a couple of things. The first is, this is humans pushing progress. This is not a physical law. It's like there's no re rhyme or reason behind this. This is humans pushing this progress forward. The second one is, this is a logarithmic graph. So what you would expect to see on a graph is a, just a straight line. What you see, though, is that this line is peeling upwards. What this means is that the rate of change itself is accelerating. So we're seeing more and more change. 
Again, being enabled by the breakthroughs we are making in technology. And then you can do something really fun and very profound with this graph. You can take this graph and you can extrapolate it into the future. So now we can take this graph and say, okay, so if we know computing is here today and we know it moves on this curve, where will it be in the future? And then you can do this crazy math and detect and uh, predict that by 2029, a $1,000 device will have the raw compute power of a human brain. Let that sink in. In 11 years, your iPhone, what is it, 18, probably? Your iPhone 18 will have the raw compute power of a human brain. And then two years later, two human brains, and four, and eight, and 16. And by 2050, 2060, you're somewhere at a rate of 7.4 billion brains, all of humanity's collective knowledge, brain power knowledge on a $1,000 device. That is changing everything. And we explore this today quite a bit. So we had these moments we call the Gutenberg moment, right? Like the Gutenberg press comes out, changes everything. Um, the Ford Model T comes out, changes transportation. The uh, light bulb comes out, changes everything. We have these moments, but they happen to be decades and sometimes centuries apart. We are moving into a world where we see these exponential trends, these Gutenberg moments literally happen every year. Albert Allen Bartlett, who taught these exponential trends, once said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. What he means by that is very simple. The observable universe to us, the way we make sense of the world around us is linear. We look at the day, the day has 24 hours, the seasons come and go. It's a very linear way. We're exceptionally good at understanding linear trends. And you might have seen this example, so just let me repeat it for you. Imagine you take 30 linear steps, you know exactly how far you get, you get to 30 meters. More importantly, you know how far it is, how far it feels. Now imagine you take 30 exponential steps, every step twice as far as your last. This is computing, it gets to a, mil a billion meters, 25, nearly 26 times around planet Earth. What is important, and I keep reminding people about this, is not the actual math. You can do the math, of course. But first of all, you need to face, force yourself to do the math because a lot of people don't, can't do this in their heads. Secondly, and this is much more important, is you need to feel it. So you need to change the way you're seeing the world. And this event, of course, is all about this. Now, when you map this exponential growth and the linear reality of our brains, you come into three interesting parts. The first one is this disappointment. Because you look at the technology and in the beginning it is not good enough because you want it to be better. For those of you who have experience with Google Glass, and I used to work at Google, when we released Google Glass, I was wearing Google Glass for about three months on our campus. And there's an interesting thing about Google Glass. Google Glass, was a pro as a product, as a product category, fell quite clearly into this area because Google Glass was too expensive, the battery life was terrible, the features were mediocre, and when you wore it, you looked like an idiot. <laughs> so you're disappointed, and rightfully so you're disappointed. The challenge is most people, when they're disappointed, they're dismissing technology. And then you get to this moment where Steve Jobs, literally a couple miles away from here, 11 years ago, gets on stage and shows you the iPhone for the first time. And you realize, oh my God, technology is there. A phone isn't a phone anymore. A phone is now a computer. And a phone doesn't have buttons, it has glass. And everything changes because then we get into chaos and amazement. Like you can't keep up with the changes we're seeing in the world anymore. In some industries, we're already at this phase. The challenge is here, if you stay, if your thinking stays on this line, and granted, you are here at Singularity University Summit, so you will change your thinking if you haven't done so already. But this is your clear path to doom. Once a technology becomes digitized or digitally enabled, it moves on an exponential curve. It changes dramatically. Peter Diamandis, our other co-founder, has this framework called the 60s of disruption. It's a really beautiful framework to think about the world. Let me super quickly walk you through this. I use this as an example. This is Stephen Sasson who invented the digital camera, first digital camera which he holds up there. Huge 0.01 megapixels recorded uh, on a cassette tape. So for everyone, by the way, under the age of 18, a cassette tape is like an MP3 but kind of weird. 27 seconds to record the picture in black and white. Here's how this works. In the beginning, you start out with digitization. You take something which was analog, you turn it into a digital good. So you take film, digital process, and turn it into a digital process. 
we start out with it being deceptive, 0.01 megapixels. It doubles every time, so it goes from 0.01 to 0.02 to 0.04 to 0.08. Every single time it doubles, and it's still not good enough. Eventually, it becomes disruptive. This is when the lines are crossing, the magic point, two megapixels. I remember buying a two megapixel camera. I never bought film anymore. And then you get into this crazy world where you dematerialize technology, so you're not actually even buying technology anymore. It's like it's software. Like everyone who's taking a picture of this slide right now, you're taking it on a phone which has about a dollar's worth of hardware. The rest is software. You demonetize it. I'm not buying film anymore, not processing it. All this goes away. And ultimately, I democratize it. I leave you with my last quote. This is uh, Ron Shake. Make this your mantra. Ron Shake is a dear friend of mine. He's the founder of Panera Bread, a healthy fast food chain. And Ron has a company mantra, and I think this is, this is on point for every leader in this world. Our approach has always been to, uh, been to discover today what matters tomorrow and then transform our company into a future that is unfolding before us. I think that is what you have to do as a, as a leader these days. And this is what we're going to explore. We're going to explore the future today.